Good afternoon everyone and welcome as we explore the conservation project Making Central Inland Glossies Great Again presented by Local Land Services, National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Forestry Corporation of New South Wales. I'm Belinda Hanley from the External Communications Team at the Department of Planning and Environment and I'll be your host today. As we meet together virtually across the state, we each stand on the lands of many different nations and I acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ongoing connection to land, water, air and community. Joining me first up today is Libby McIntyre, Project Officer with Local Land Services. Libby has worked in natural resource management for over 30 years and most recently in the world of birds and their conservation. I'm now delighted to hand over to you, Libby. Hello everyone, it's uh, Libby McIntyre speaking. Welcome to today's uh, presentation, Making Central Inland Glossies Great Again. Thanks for Belinda for being our host. Uh, I'm on Wiradjuri country today in Dubbo and I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people present today. So uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, our agenda today covers these specific topics and we hope you enjoy the presentations. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview about the project. Laura Douglas will speak about glossy identification and habitat. Adam Fawcett will talk about the annual glossy count and Pat, Dr Pat Tapp will talk about the technology that we are using throughout this project. Toward the end, if you, uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please um, put those into the, uh, into the public chat, as Belinda have, have said. And what we'll also do is to put our email addresses for the four presenters in the chat if you would like any further um, information from us. So Making Central Inland Gloss is great again. This is a seven year project and is funded by the New South Wales Environmental Trust Saving Our Species program. It is a collaborative partnership with local land services, the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service, Forestry Corporation of New South Wales, the Dubbo Field Naturalists and Conservation Society, the Department of Planning and Environment, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, plus our enthusiastic working team from across these groups. The project aims to carry out a wide range of activities over that period of time to promote and implement conservation activities within the Central West region. We are currently in the third year of the seven year project. In the initial phase of the project, we have focused on identifying priority habitats, undertaking surveys to monitor the populations and raising awareness about the species and its associated habitat within targeted areas. A priority foraging and breeding habitat map has been developed to ensure the work carried out throughout the project will be within the highest priority areas. Surveillance cameras and song meters have been deployed in the Pilliga and Gnu to measure the presence and populations of glossies along with feral and native animal populations. A large scale annual citizen science project which includes the inland glossy count surveys glossy numbers annually combined with a number of field days and training workshops. Ultimately, the aim of the project is to use the data and research collected to advise both public and private land managers for the glossy blacks and how to protect and enhance breeding and habitat foraging areas with the aim to increase population numbers. Threats to the glossy black cockatoo include clearing of specialised vegetation that the glossy feeds on, decline of hollow bearing trees for nesting due to clearing, fire and age which affects those old trees, competition from feral herbivores and stock foraging on alocasurinas, loss of water sources, drought, disturbance from mining activities, weed infestation and sadly illegal poaching of eggs and birds. On this slide you can see uh, the, the map of the three major areas that we are working on and that includes Pilliga National Park um, to the north and that includes the Forestry Corporation area and land also managed by the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. 
As we come a bit further south towards Dubbo, this is the GNU National Park and Associated Conservation Reserves. We head down further south towards parks and this long skinny park is Goobang National Park. We have private landholders who are adjacent to these areas have been invited to partake in our annual glossy black counts and also be part of training workshops. And this late last year, landholders in these priority areas could apply for funding opportunities to help them improve the habitat for the glossy black. The green areas, if you're wondering, in the map are Alocasurina, which is the preferred species by the glossy black. Some of the activities that we will be carrying out on this particular project, the annual black glossy counts, uh, which Adam will talk to about shortly. And this year we're hoping for dry weather until the end of February so we can access these sites without uh, getting bogged. Uh, we are keen to see how the numbers are across these three areas. It's important to involve the community in these events for them to gain skills in identifying glossies and knowledge of how to be an integral part of the counts that we conduct. We have carried out a range of community engagement events which are listed there including glossies and gelato bird watching in the Pilliga which was very popular. Uh, the get to know the glossy black cockatoo with Central West Lock Land Care. Glossies in the GNU with Dr Matt Cameron and this webinar which you are attending today. Some of the activities that we are actually doing on ground um, will include um, a little bit that Pat will touch about a bit later in his presentation. We will be monitoring water point condition and further analyse the priority vegetation map and the suitability of the habitat and condition for glossies. The project will also be revamping and monitoring 130 existing nest boxes and possibly installing other types of hollows across the reserves. This year on ground activities will be carried out with private landholders and will include weed and pest animal control, strategic revegetation with important foraging and habitat species and possibly some nest hollow augmentation. Thank you for the introduction Libby. I'd now like to introduce Adam Fawcett, Project Officer with Threatened Species National Parks and Wildlife Service. Over to you Adam. Thanks very much for that Belinda. Uh, my name is Adam Fawcett and I'm the um, Project Officer Threatened Species for the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service and I've been doing land management on uh, wildlife for many years and I'm going to talk about the Great Inland Glossy Count today. So uh, what I'll run through is just uh, why we undertake the count, the scope of the count for the project, how it fits into the broader project that Libby's just outlined, results for the last two years, the how, the what and the where of the Great Inland Glossy Count itself, how it all goes, um, how you can register and what you need to bring in the things you need to bear in mind during the count. The counts for the inland population of the Glossy Black Cockatoo have been happening for some time. The Dubbo Field Naturalist and Conservation Society have been undertaking biennial counts in GNU since about 1995 and the Dubbo Field Nats are one of our project partners on this broader project. A count was also run in the Pilliga in 2014 as a collaboration between the Pilliga Birdwatchers and the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. But the Goobang National Park area has not had a count. It's never had the same sort of uh, broad scale glossy black cockatoo counts. Um, and so all the information we're collecting there and all the work we're doing is all brand new. It's basically starting from scratch. And these counts provide valuable information on the status of the populations as a snapshot in time. And then we can use that information to uh, monitor for changes in the population and plan management actions along the lines of uh, including um, tree planting for habitat as well as food and, and um, future nest trees, habitat protection from things like weeds and other things, fire management which can take out the alocasurinas particularly and also affect hollow bearing trees, uh, competition with other species particularly for nesting sites with other cockatoo species, protection of nests from predation and other actions as well. So those are some of the management actions we can do, there's, there's a few others um, and that will help us maintain the population overall. 
In terms of what the Count's aim to do, we're aiming to survey all three target areas. So that's the Pilliga Forest, GNU and the Gubang area uh, at roughly the same time. Um, doing the count at roughly the same time should give us an independent population estimate, but given the logistics between the distance between those three sites and the number of sampling points that we're looking at, uh, running them on the same weekend hasn't been something we've been able to manage. So they are being done spread apart from a week apart, but that should give us a, a a good enough indication of the number of animals. There will be a little bit of overlap, but we've taken that into account in terms of double counting and those sorts of things. The counts are centered on those three large areas of Crown lands. However, it's not restricted to just the Crown land itself. It can occur on the surrounding area, on private property and other tenures. So it's not just the Crown lands we're interested in. And given that the area of the sites, the counts are focused on water points. And the reason we do this is because the glossy black cockatoos are being observed to regularly come down and drink. They do it during the day, uh, a couple of times a day. And particularly in the evening, they're well known for coming in for a drink before they go to roost. And this behaviour gives us an opportunity to survey these animals that normally forage over a very large area at a small number of sites because they're focused and concentrated in on those sites. So that makes it much easier for us to get a clear count of what's going on with the population. So the results from the last two years, we've had the Great Inland Glossy Count running for since 2019, and we've done it twice so far. Volunteers have made a huge contribution to the count. Um, we've had 159 people participating, and that's sort of, there's some double ups in there because we've had people out multiple times, but overall, those people have contributed over 715 hours of their time to help us with the counts, which has just been awesome. And it's a massive part of what we're doing and we couldn't do the counts without people volunteering to help us. We've had glossy black seen at all three sites for each of the years that we've run the count, but there's been a shift the shift from the very, very dry drought that we had in 2019 to the very wet, very wet La Nina systems that we've had the last couple of years has impacted the results. So to give you a bit of an idea, um, what we've got here is the these three graphs show the results for the last two years for all three sites. In the in the graphs, the centre column is the for each of the years is the number of glossy black cockatoos, and in you can see in the Pilliga, we had 510 glossies sighted in 2019-20, and then in 2020-21 it dropped down to 54. Same thing happened in GNU with 246 glossies counted in 2019-20, and then in 2021 we had 11. Gubang, on the other hand, went the other way. We had two animals sighted in 2019, and then six in 2020. The numbers are still low, um, we know that, but uh, that's still because, if you remember, we're still trying to work out what's happening with Gubang, where the animals are drinking, um, how they're moving within that landscape, because we don't have any previous information to inform us there. So still a lot of work going on in there. But this change, if you go back to Pilliga and Gnu, is pretty indicative of the fact that we've gone from incredibly dry, where everything was focused on those water points, to very, very wet and a lot of freestanding water right across the landscape. And generally the glossy blacks are much more dispersed within the landscape and less dependent on those fixed watering points. So the count is still continuing, even though this is the case, because it gives us um, an opportunity to look at change in relation to changing of the seasons and these changes from very wet, very dry to very wet. And we're assuming that at some point it'll start to go dry again. Um, and we're expecting that this year's result uh, happening this month will be similar to last year, given the conditions that we've seen. So the how, the what, and the where of the Great Inland Glossy Count. So how we run the count is that um, basically we, we get people out to go and sit at the, the water points and, and watch for animals. But due to COVID-19 restrictions last year particularly, but also this year, the count has to be undertaken by remote deployment. And what that means is that we have everyone getting registered to who are going to participate uh, registered through the volunteer information portal, um, which I'll put a link up for in a second. And once the people have registered in there, each volunteer is then assigned to undertake the count um, at a certain low watering point for all the sites. And then the maps and other relevant information is emailed out the Thursday before the count. So the 
emails for the Pilliga will go out on Thursday the 10th of February and emails for GNU will go out on Thursday the 17th of February. And that gives you time to get that information, review it and um, get prepared to go out in the field and make sure you know where you're going. Once you've got all that information, then the volunteers themselves, they go out and they make their way to their site and they get set up on the day of the count by 6 p.m. the latest. And we say 6 p.m. because that gives you plenty of time to get in there, get settled, get organised, position yourself so you've got a good view of the water point um, so that you can um, be ready for the count. And volunteers can go there earlier if they really want and make the day of it. A um, few people do, um, but it really is up to you. But 6 p.m. is this, the point we need you there. And that positioning thing is really important because if you're too close to the water point, the birds will spook and they won't come in to drink. Um, and we really need them to be able to come down so you can get a good look at them. So you'll know if you're too close during your setup phase because other birds and animals won't go near the water point. They'll spook when they see you and they'll all take off. So if that's happening, you just move back a bit, still with a good view so you can see the water point and all the trees around it. And then you sit back and you wait and you enjoy the evening. If the glossies come in to drink, uh, basically record all the information that's required as per the data sheets that we supply. And usually the first sign that you'll get uh, that they're coming in is you'll hear them calling. And they sound like a low pitched creaky door as they communicate with one another as they fly in for a drink. And then you stay on site until the last animals have flown away or it gets too dark to see and then pack up and make your way home. A uh, few people do camp, which is also an option as well. So where you count, as I said, we're focused on those water points across all three sites. Um, and those sites are selected based on a number of factors depending on the sites. So with the Pilliga, um, it's got over 80 water points right across the Pilliga Forest. So that's the national parks, the forestry areas, the AWC area all combined. Um, and so we narrow down the where we're going to count by looking at accessibility, which is a major critical factor for the Pilliga because uh, we've got, um, particularly with the weather we've had, there's some issues with, with access to some points. But also we narrow it down a bit further by looking at sites where we know the glossy is frequent, where we've got regular records. Um, and that helps us narrow down. We'd like to get all 80 water points counted some year, but at the moment we, we never seem to be able to manage it. It's always got to be a, a narrower um, subset of that group. But uh, it's been good results so far, as you've seen. GNU has a smaller number of water points. So there's, I think, 12 all up across the GNU forest area. Um, and so the aim there is to target all of those. But again, accessibility, um, given road conditions, is, is a fact that we need to, to consider every time. And with Goobang, uh, basically, we're still, we've got very few water points out there that we can use across the reserve. And so we're still targeting those where we can. And what we're going to do is looking at alternate methods and also other sites that we can consider. And that includes, for all three sites, we're keen to expand into areas of the surrounding Crown land, um, surrounding the Crown land. So that means private property now the tenures. Um, so if people know of a site that's near these areas on private property or other tenure and would be interested in participating, please let us know. We'd love to have you out there on your dams watching the glossies come in to drink of an evening and contribute that information to help us with the counts. It would certainly expand, particularly for Goobang, exactly where we're, uh, what we're finding out and getting more information. So how to register the count. There's, if you haven't already done so, there is still plenty of time to get involved in the counts with the uh, Pilliga Forest count happening next Saturday on the 12th of February. And as I said, the registrations close on the 9th of February. Um, yep, and the GNU uh, State Conservation Area National Park is on the 19th of February with registrations closing on the 16th. Goobang isn't being surveyed this year, unfortunately, because we've had some issues with access and some other problems, and we're trying to sort that out. So it's, unfortunately, this year we've had to drop it off, uh, but we are continuing to work on that. So if you are in that landscape, please let us know if you're interested in being involved in work happening there as well. To register for the count, uh, you go to that address, which is nswparks.info slash glossy, or in your browser search for Great Inland Glossy Count and that will bring you to uh, the link as well. And you basically, it's the, it takes you to the National Park event website page and then you click on the book now button and create a login or log into the volunteer information portal, fill in all the details 
And while you're there, make sure you select which weekend you'd like to participate so that we can know and we can assign you to the, uh, a site within those, water point within those sites to complete your registration. Uh, what you need to bring to be part of the count, uh, apart from your good self, is um, we'd recommend the following things. A map, the map that we supply uh, of how to get there, but if you've got a broader map of the landscape you're going into, that's very useful. Pen, pencil, the data sheets are pretty important because they've got everything there and we can pull all that information off as we need, but if you forget it, um, then a notebook so that you can record what you see. Binoculars are absolutely crucial because um, you're not going to be sitting right on top of the birds on the water, water point, you're going to be sitting back a bit so you need those to make sure you've got your IDs right and also if we're going to um, get counts of males, females and the juveniles, which we'll get Laura back on to talk about that in a minute. A field guide for Australian birds is always useful. A really comfy chair uh, is a must. Plenty of food and water, uh, drinking water. Sunscreen, insect repellent this year is an absolute must because of the mozzies with all the water around. A hat, dress for the conditions and some sturdy boots. So the last bit to talk about is a bit about the safety. Um, the landscape in which these counts are undertaken is generally remote. And that's so that you have an enjoyable count, you need to remember to have the following things. Make sure you've got enough food and water in case of emergencies. Bring appropriate clothing for the conditions. So if it's going to be cold, warm clothing, if it's going to be hot, something cool, so that you're comfortable. And ensure your vehicle is well maintained, has an inflated spare, and is suitable for the terrain in which you're travelling. This photo is from the Pilliga and it's uh, of some of the conditions we've been dealing with for the last six months. And as you can see there, it's pretty nasty. Um, we really are going to try and make sure that we're not sending you along roads that look like that. But if you do come across one as you're trying to access your site, we don't want you to go in there. Common sense prevails. Take a look, turn around, go out, let us know that you're safe and that what you found, it, you couldn't make it to the dam, the water point. Uh, we'll write that one off for this year and just make a note that we need to look at the roads and work that one out. So leading on from that, a uh, mobile phone or a satellite phone for communication with the project team is important as well. And we require that all the volunteers must check in before they go into their site um, by a text or a phone call. Um, and noting that phone reception across these project sites is patchy at best. Um, so pick a, a suitable point where you've got phone reception, let us know that you're heading in, and then as you leave and once you get back out and you're basically safely on the, on the road heading on your way home and you're in reception, send us another text or a phone call to say that you're safe. Staff will be working around in the area, so we'll also be out doing the counts as well and if you get into problems you can let us know and we can try and help, um, we can come in and sort that out as well. So that's that's basically the way we work it and in terms of details, as there's a lot more information that's provided as the information package that gets emailed out to you so that you've got some more information about how to do it, who to contact and all of that stuff. So that's it for me um, in terms of the gradient and glossy count. Thank you very much for listening and I think we're going to hand back to Laura. Thanks Adam. So I'm here today to talk about the Glossy Black. So the Glossy Black Cockatoo is one of the smallest black cockatoos ranging from around 46 to 50 centimetres in length. They have a wingspan of about 90 centimetres and they weigh around 425 grams. Their life expectancy is believed to exceed 15 years but could possibly extend to around 50 years or more. So the glossy black has a small and inconspicuous crest and a bulb, the bulbous bill, eye ring and legs are a dark grey colour. The body is a dull black colour with feathers on the head, neck and underparts fringed in brown. The tail has red to an orange yellow tail panel which are clearly visible when the birds are in flight. Juvenile birds will have black horizontal bands between the colours in their tail which diminishes with age. The bird on the right in this picture is a young adult male and we can tell this by the bands that you can see in that tail, those, those black lines. Female and male birds are distinctly different. Female glossy blacks are more brightly coloured than males, which is a rare trait amongst birds. It suggests that there is a strong competition among females for resources or for male attention. So you can see here, this one is a female. Uh, she's, she's a younger one. 
which you can tell by the striping in the tail. So females have a whiter tail with reddish orange to yellow panels barred with black. The tail may become less barred and more red with age. But um, what makes them very distinctive is they'll have these irregular yellow markings around their head and neck. Um, they can vary in intensity from a few spots to a full colouring of a covering of yellow. And they may also have yellow flecks on the underparts and underwings. So here we have a male. The, bird, the male bird has a browner colour on the head and underparts, and it has a prominent red panel in the tail. This picture is a younger male, um, so you, and you can see that by the barring, which is a little bit hard to see, but um, still visible in this picture. So the glossy blacks are widespread, although uncommon. They occur in low densities throughout suitable forest and woodland habitats. Their range is from the central Queensland coast to East Gippsland in Victoria. There is also a small population in the New South Wales Riverina and an isolated population on Kangaroo Island down in South Australia. They are occasionally recorded well beyond the usual range, which suggests that the species moves between different areas when they need to. In New South Wales, the current distribution of the glossy black is from the coast to the tablelands and as far west as the Riverina and Pilliga scrub. Scientists think that glossy blacks prefer to live in open, rugged country where extensive clearing has not taken place. In inland New South Wales, they target areas of brigalow scrub, hilly rocky country or timbered watercourses where casuarina species are common. They are frequently seen throughout the Pilliga, Gnu and Goobang reserves. So the map on the screen shows all of the glossy black sightings that have been recorded in New South Wales. Glossy blacks prefer to nest in the hollows of large old eucalyptus trees, either living or dead. A good hollow is close to water, can be between 3 to 30 metres above the ground, has an entrance diameter of at least 15 centimetres and is around a metre deep. The hollow will be vertical or near vertical and is generally lined with wood chips chewed from the edge. They will tend to nest in the same area as other nesting glossy black pairs and can um, even share the same tree if more than one hollow is available. The same hollow is often used again in subsequent years by the same or different females. Glossy blacks must compete with other hollow dependent mammals such as possums and gliders and other birds such as the Lars and sulphur crested cockatoos for a suitable nesting hollow. The birds are not strictly territorial amongst themselves as they may forage over large areas but they may defend nest trees and favoured feeding areas. The adult birds will mate for life and pairs will maintain their bond throughout the year. In the central west, breeding can take place between March to August. Breeding time varies across their range and it's thought the timing corresponds to the reproduction of their local feed tree species. A single white egg is laid in the hollow. The egg is incubated for around 30 days, during which time the female will remain on the nest and is fed by the male. Once the chick is born, there are some instances where both parents will feed the chick and the female will brood the chick overnight, but at other times, only the female will brood and feed the chick. The chick is fledged after about 90 days and they only have the one chick per season. A young bird will stay with its parents for at least a year after fledging. Glossy blacks will have a lower breeding rate during drier years when their food source is in lower supply. Allocasuarina have reduced seed productivity in dry years, so any increase in drought frequency or length is likely to have a negative effect on the population of the glossy black. Glossy blacks are social birds and are typically observed in pairs or family groups. The small groups can join together to form larger feeding flocks. In the evenings, they may also congregate in large numbers as they come down to water. The birds need to come to water to drink every day. They prefer to drink at sites where vegetation grows close to the water's edge with a resting place and cover from predators. When temperatures are high, the birds may need to drink more frequently throughout the day. Glossy blacks are highly specialised in their food choice and will feed almost exclusively on the seeds of mature Allocasuarina species. There is also evidence that the bird is selective in its choice of Allocasuarina trees and will choose casuarinas that produce seeds with a high nutrient value. A pair of glossy blacks may make short visits to various feed trees in a small area, checking the quality of the seeds. Once they're satisfied, the pair will settle in the feed tree and harvest all the cones within reach. The birds use their left foot to rotate the cone and their large bill to crack and shred the cones and access the kernels. They are often quiet and inconspicuous while feeding, but will make a soft clicking sound with their bills. The birds are highly selective of both the trees and the cones they favour and will often return to particular trees in which they have foraged previously. 
They will choose the younger red coloured cones as they are more nutritious and have a high seed weight in order to yield as much seed as possible for their cone opening efforts. They will also use older cones when fresh ones are not available. The glossy black will concentrate their feeding in larger stands of Allocasuarina containing mature trees with large cone and seed crops. The larger stands reduce the need to move between trees which lowers the overall foraging requirements and the energy that needs to be expended. Less movement between trees may also reduce the predation risk from birds of prey. They avoid feeding in areas of sparse canopy cover. Depending on the availability of food, a bird may require between 83 to 122 cones per day. If a bird is breeding, they will feed on a higher number of cones per day and spend more time foraging than non-breeding birds. A breeding male will forage for just over six hours a day in order to feed himself and the female while she is brooding. Males have been found to forage more efficiently than females and juveniles forage less efficiently than both the, the male and female adults. Glossy blacks will also occasionally eat seeds from eucalypts, angophoras, acacias and hakias as well as insect larvae. In the central west where they inhabit the cypress ironbark forest, the Allocasuarina gomanthera and Allocasuarina diminuta are important food resources. They have also been known to eat the seeds of cypress pine. The presence of feeding glossy blacks is often indicated by a layer of chewed cones and fragments that have accumulated under their favourite Allocasuarina trees. The chewed cones can remain on the ground for several weeks to months and are a clear indication that the stands of Allocasuarina has been used for feeding. Glossy black cockatoos are strong flyers and can average over 45 kilometres an hour in sustained flight. They will fly up to 14 kilometres daily between their feeding and nesting areas without breeding success being compromised, but they prefer to forage closer when food is available. Their flight is buoyant with a shallow, effortless feeding of the wings. They prefer to travel through the canopy and not over open country. Individuals tend to remain close to their family flock but can disperse when required. When they do disperse, they can move large distances of between 44 to 78 kilometres away, although there is evidence that they have travelled up to 300 kilometres in northern Queensland. The glossy black is now rare or locally extinct in many parts of its former range. It's listed as vulnerable in New South Wales and endangered on the federal schedule. The main threat to the glossy black is the degradation, loss and fragmentation of foraging and breeding habitat. Allocasuarina trees are being lost due to clearing and fires, Poor regeneration of these trees can occur due to crazy, uh, sorry, grazing and repeated burning. Losing hollow bearing nest trees also has a significant impact on breeding success. The trees are removed during land clearing for firewood or burned during a wild, wildfire or hazard reduction burn. In 2007 a fire in Gnu destroyed much of the feeding habitat and nest trees used by the glossy blacks. While the landscape has recovered, the loss of nest trees is still having an impact on the species. Um, so they installed uh, some PVC pipe nest boxes back in around 2010 to try and um, alleviate that problem, but they, they haven't been too successful unfortunately. Um, community involvement can help conserve this species. By assisting with surveys at water points and foraging areas, the number of birds can be recorded and monitored. This can impact on the decisions made around the management of the surrounding landscape. By working together, we can all help this amazing bird. Thanks for listening and I look forward to any questions at the end of today's session. So I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Pat Tapp, Senior Field Ecologist with Forestry Corporation of New South Wales. And Pat oversees the pre-harvesting flora and fauna surveys and biodiversity monitoring on lands across western New South Wales. Welcome Pat. Thanks Laura. What, um, what I'd like to do is just provide you an overview of some of the tactics that we're going to be using uh, to learn more about um, what the glossy blacks actually get up to when we find that uh, when they move away from dams and also uh, what parts of the landscape they're using. So what we know so far, we know that glossy black cockatoos nest in tree hollows and that they'll fly long distances between nesting and feeding sites. We know that they feed on the cones of Allocasuarina plants. I just put some arrows there to show you these are uh, shrubs of Allocasuarina diminuta. Uh, they'll feed on other Allocasuarinas and uh, they'll also uh, feed on, cash, on Casuarina called Bilal. And that's particularly prominent uh, in areas where uh, we don't get 
uh, Alocasia arenas. And they come down to water to drink. And some people theorise that they potentially also come to uh, these regular water points as much as anything to socialise. Because we have noticed that not all birds uh, will come down to drink. They'll hang around the area for quite a while uh, in, in their family groups. And that needs to be taken into account when we start um, conducting surveys uh, for these birds. The other thing to take into account is that we have, as Adam said, we have at least 80 water points. Uh, in this case, I'm talking about the pilliga. And the indicative habitat for the glossy black cockatoo in the pilliga, for example, spans some 270,000 hectares. And to get a bit of perspective on that, uh, the pelaga, if you put, draw a straight line east to west, at its widest point, we're talking about 120 kilometres. So we're talking about large areas uh, that we need to survey. And I thought I'd just talk a bit about the way we survey for birds. It's changed a lot uh, since I started, what, 30 odd years ago, uh, surveying for uh, wildlife, and it's now heavily influenced by changes in technology. So when I started, uh, the old survey kit was basically well, a film camera, uh, a notebook, a pair of binoculars, a compass, handheld compass for navigation, a hard copy map, uh, and a field guide. And that was all shoved into your backpack and off you went. Now these days, we've got digital cameras, and I'll talk about the significance of that in a minute. Uh, we've got GPSs for navigation, so, uh, and also maps on uh, tablets like iPads, and we can also uh, enter data on those. But more significantly, uh, we've got, we can use remotely deployed cameras and sound recorders. And we use those really to supplement uh, the surveys that have been done to date on dams. And we deploy those uh, into at dams, because we've got a lot of them, uh, and uh, in feeding habitat that we've already identified. So here's an example. Uh, on the left, I've just shown you some images uh, of a song meter in a tree, which is just a brand of acoustic recorder. And uh, this is actually in my front yard, I took it yesterday, uh, and a camera uh, uh, in a different part of the same tree. So the advantage of these devices is that they are digital, which means that uh, we can analyse the information using computers. The other advantage is that we can deploy them for long periods. We can program them to record continuously or at preset intervals. In the case of cameras, they can be motion activated or we can have them, say, take a picture every five, min five minutes or every minute. Uh, we can take video. And um, they're cost effective compared to on-ground observers. Now, before we get too carried away, we have to be aware of some of the downsides. That they can recall thousands of images and sound files which need to be catalogued and stored. Unlike going to a dam uh, or going for a walk, the results are not instant. They rely and so we need to look at the information and because there's so many files, we need to use computer technology, which is still being developed for rapid sorting and identification. The other thing we need to bear in mind is that you put a sound recorder out there, unlike human hearing, uh, you're not necessarily hearing everything um, other than what's in the general vicinity. Like I know I've done barking owl surveys and I can hear barking owls calling for up to a kilometre away. 
So it depends on the sensitivity of the microphone. So the important thing here is that you need multiple sites to develop an accurate picture. So I just thought I'd speak quickly about uh, the data that comes out uh, from uh, a song meter, which is a digital recorder. So the idea is that we convert um, the digital signal, is con we can have a look at that uh, as a visual image, and that visual image is analysed using what's called recognisers, which need to be developed for that species. Um, and once you've got that, it's based on particular patterns, and, and you can see on the images to the right, there's squiggly marks there, and um, the one on the bottom, the uh, the tower of calls, there's three of them there. Uh, that's a particular, I think that could well possibly be um, uh, juveniles um, with begging noises and there's other smaller um, squiggles in between those. So we can develop a recognizer based on reference calls to um, eventually use the computer to rapidly sort through and classify thousands of call files. In the old days, we would call that up and do them one by one. Now, obviously, uh, that's not practical. Now, forestry's been doing this sort of work, uh, putting out this sort of equipment uh, since 2013, um, and we'll be deploying uh, the gear that we're using on our other projects uh, onto this project as well. The thing to bear in mind that any output that we have needs to be checked by an experienced observer. Now in the time that's remaining, I just thought I'd show you some pictures of what we've captured on camera uh, in, our, in another monitoring project that we're working on. And if you have a look in the center of our bottom center of the photo on the left, you'll see a tube there. And we've got a camera pointing at that tube. And it's got uh, a bait inside, which is uh, peanut butter, and also a little wad with sesame oil. And it's used as a bit of an attractant. Now, all the work that we do um, is under permit from the Department of Planning and Environment and complies with uh, animal ethics. Uh, so we can't just go out there willy-nilly and do this work. We have to use uh, approved protocols and um, train surveyors and, and uh, do it under uh, reproducible methodologies. OK, so here we go. Bird on the left, that's a common bronze wing. On the right, we've got some emus uh, visiting a dam which we uh, observed uh, during testing of our cameras. On the left, an apostle bird, grey crowned babbler, which is one of our threatened birds in the pilliga. Swamp wallaby on the left. Black striped wallaby, uh, another one of our threatened species, uh, also captured in the pilliga. Now we can also take pictures at night. So these cameras have got a black flash. Um, so hence we get a grey photo. On the left, there's some grey kangaroo. On the right, it's an echidna. We can also get pictures of very small animals. That's the yellow-footed antichinus uh, on the left, and a lace monitor uh, on the right, so we're capturing different species. Now, we can also get information on foxes uh, and other feral animals, which helps which will assist with uh, where we might need to direct predator control. So we've got a cast of a lot, goats, yes, cats, and pigs, and that's it. Thank you. Back to Libby for some question time. Thank you so much, Pat. That was great. All right, I'd like to welcome back all of yeah. our panellists, if you could all um, put on your microphones and join in the discussion.
So now is the time um, for questions and we've had some answers put through for some of the questions. Um, I think Adam has answered some of those in uh, in the chat. I think we'll just start with one which was um, the type of software used in a type of database. So um, Pat's had a bit of a chat about the um, uh, technology that we're using. Uh, there's not a, a particular type of so software or a particular type of database, but Pat, you might like to talk a little bit more to that if you have any further information or we can um, email the, um, the attendee and just and let them know if there's any further details on that. Yeah, look, I'm happy to email the attendee, but um, broadly speaking, uh, we use, uh, we're sort of exploring the use of proprietary software. There's uh, software put out um, by Wildlife Acoustics from the US. We actually uh, use uh, one of their recorders. Uh, and uh, there's also work uh, that we're doing with uh, one of our forestry's project partners from uh, the Department of Primary Industry. Uh, where we're developing recognisers. Um, okay, so, thank yeah, that's thanks, Pat. probably the detail I can provide there. Okay, thanks, Pat. That's great. Um, another question is the likelihood of localised populations travelling to other areas to socialise and communicate with other family groups. Adam, perhaps you might like to um, talk about that. Yeah, thanks, Libby. Uh, basically, what we know between the across that broad distribution of the glossy black cockatoo, the uh, image that Laura put up that showed a very strong concentration along the ranges and the coast and the inland, there isn't a lot or very much interchange at all between those populations. So the inland population is separate. In terms of movement between sites for interaction, social or otherwise, um, we're fairly confident that that does happen. They will range over a very large area and I think Laura did point out that they're not necessarily territorial like some other species. So that's not the big factor. They will move around and they will cover large areas, particularly if they're on the hunt for food or their favourite area for food disappears. So yeah, there is a a distinct chance that they're going to move from, say, the Pilliga up around Narrabri all the way down towards parks. But, you know, they need those stepping stones to be able to do it as, uh, across that landscape. Great. Thanks very much, Adam. And um, just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Really, really interesting presentations. As always, I learn something new every time. Uh, question three, I would like to volunteer and become more involved in the industry and would love some direction. So, uh, here's a great opportunity to uh, register for the Inland Glossy Count, either at the uh, Pilliga or the GNU. I'm not sure where, where you are based, but uh, if you'd like to send me an email, and our, my email address is now in the public, in the public chat, um, that, would be, um, that would be good, and then I can talk to you a little bit more about that. I think we've covered how the survey uh, is organised, so it's pretty much a combined effort of the... Um, Inland Glossy team who work it out, particularly with uh, national parks, they do the lion's share of that, um, in particular Adam. So that's uh, that's absolutely um, a really important thing that we do quite regularly. We generally run the um, surveys we had hoped to run in November, but both of the Novembers we wanted to run them. It was it was uh, too wet or there were fires, so that's when we came around to um, doing them in February. We do certainly have some data and information um, regarding some nest box design, but as Laura in, um, indicated in her presentation, there hasn't been a great deal of success. I know they've had some success certainly after the fires on um, Kangaroo Island in South Australia, and that's worked um, quite well for Glossy Blacks. Um, and yes, the uh, nest boxes that are currently there are, are being monitored. Um, and that has really been restricted again because of uh, very uh, wet weather and conditions, but that certainly is, uh, is being done. Libby, I was just going to say, there has been, uh, there is other research going on, particularly post-fire within the Warren Bungles um, part of the landscape, looking at nest boxes and how they're used mm -hmm. by animals and what other factors need to be considered. And there's also a lot of work post the 2019-20 bushfires as well, more broadly across mm. the state. So there is a lot of work going on and a lot of attempts to try and find solutions along those lines. So it is something that we are looking into, um, but it is a very big question. And, and as Laura's already indicated and Libby, 
there are problems with the nest boxes that we've had out the birds aren't using them as much so it's something that we're continuing to work on mm, thanks thanks adam the, there are other options of using uh options like uh, augmented hollows which um, can be done either with chainsaws or with a um, new uh, device called a hollow hog a hollow hog um, which I'm happy to send out some information. I could perhaps put a link uh, when we send out the recording link in the next day or so. I can I can uh, send that through um, to people. Uh, question uh, another question was: Can we access seedlings or tube stock to grow on our property as a food source for the birds? Uh, and I would be very happy to um, provide some information on the types of species that you'd need, depending on where you are. Um, and any supplementary plantings if you get in touch touch with me on my email address there. Uh, and another question was, has there been any interaction with um, the Biodiversity Conservation Trust? We've actually had some um, wonderful volunteers come out in one of our previous surveys from um, the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, but specifically uh, working uh, closely with them um, not, not particularly, um, but um, I think that's probably a very good suggestion, and I think that's yeah, that that's a great one. There was a question about the difference between the calls of the yellow black cockatoos and the glossy blacks. Mm. Yeah, they're quite distinctly different. Um, as I said, a glossy black is a creaky door, and a yellow tail black is quite a very strong, loud screech, and uh, very, very mm. clear. They, they they are very different in the way they behave and everything. So. Mm. Great, thanks, yeah, it's Adam. probably worth, yeah, worth adding to that that one of the advantages of the internet is one can go onto YouTube and there's lots of calls on YouTube and if, for questions like that you can actually type in there uh, glossy black cockatoo call versus whatever other call and uh, invariably a lot of that information uh, will become available. Uh, the other thing I would just follow up on what Adam said about the roads is that uh, we will, prior to uh, the next or well, the count coming up, we will endeavour to go to seek uh, information about the road conditions and probably go to some uh, dodgy road. So we will make every attempt to ensure that we don't direct you to a dam where, which may well be inaccessible because of the uh, high levels of rainfall we've had. Great. Thanks very much, Pat. That's a very, very good point to make. Um, just because we're just about, uh, we're just on one o'clock now. Uh, and thank you very much, Belinda. You put up our surveys. Um, or just, there's another couple of questions there. Uh, for Goobang, have we looked at bird data or eBird to find places away from the park? What we've, what we've actually um, done is contacted private landholders over the last two years, well over six or 700 private landholders around each of the parks to ask them become engaged with um, doing our surveys and, and providing them with extra information. Um, but yeah, bird data or eBird is, uh, is uh, a, a good suggestion. And the other ones, I think that probably we're now that we're just on time, um, I will uh, put, we can get back in touch with you regarding the, the rest of the questions. Um, have either of the other presenters wanted to make any further last comments before we let people go off and have their lunch? Yeah, I just noticed there was a question about trying to use drones. We haven't for this project, however, think of using them uh, for other species. So certainly drones uh, are in the mix uh, for uh, various wildlife. Uh, the issue we have with drones, uh, particularly for something like a glossy black cockatoo, uh, is uh, basically scaring the hell out of it. Uh, and also, um, the other one is that um, if you fly a drone in the wrong spot, uh, it'll get knocked out of the sky by things like uh, wedge tail eagles, and you'll get one dead drone. Thanks, thanks, Pat. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll um, answer any other uh, questions in a follow-up email that we'll um, send in the next day or so. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you very much indeed. Um, we had a big number of people on the webinar, which has been fantastic. Thank you very much to all our presenters for, for um, providing some really, really important information. And hopefully you've enjoyed 
the last hour or so. You will get the uh, recording in the next day or so. So if you um, would like to, you can re-listen if you've missed out on some information or please send any of us an email and we'll uh, follow up with your queries and questions there. But um, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Libby. Thank you to our presenters, Laura, Adam and Pat for sharing your valuable information. And thank you to our audience for your valuable contribution in the discussions today. I wish you all a lovely afternoon.